Jay, you rolling? Hi, welcome to Hamp's House of Tone. I'm John Hampton. This is Preston. Oh, you can't see Preston. This is Wesley. Oh, you can't see Wesley. Hello, kids. John Hampton, Hamp's House of Tone, bringing you another exciting adventure in the world of audio. Hi, Dr. Dr. John Hampton here, Hamp's House of Tone, bringing you a little bit of instruction on what to do with mics. But before we get to mics, let's talk about sound, okay? Just a little bit about sound. Mom, you can leave. Oh, hi. Welcome to Hamp's House of Tone. I am the teacher. You're the listener. You're going to learn how to make records, whether you like it or not. The stuff you're making into records right now that you got in your little cheesy laptop is crap. Recording. Keep out. <laughs> when people ask me how I got into it, I usually give them the same answer that Mark Twain gave when people asked how he became a journalist. He said that, that, that he regretted it, but he was unable to find honest employment. And I sort of fell into it because I had those two uh, uh, interests in, in what was going on in pop music and, and uh, uh, you know, what went on in all the little black boxes. One of my best friends was, was a guy named John King, who's still around town, a big record collector and, and, and radio fan uh, uh, until today. And uh, uh, Fred Smith was another guy that was in my uh, class. And actually, John King, Fred Smith, and I, uh, we started making records in the garage studio, and, and we started the Ardent label. We just liked the sound of the word. Everybody said, Where, where'd you get the name Ardent? You know, we were kids. We really didn't know what Ardent meant, you know? We just said, man, that sounds good. You know, we'll, just, we'll use that, you know? Um, and... Uh, the dictionary definition is hot, fiery, fierce, burning, or passionate. So uh, actually, it, it probably <laughs> probably turned out to to fit okay. I think this was this, it was physically this place that brought all that together. Arden had moved from over in National, and I'd been to the one on National several times, but I hadn't seen the new studio. And Alex was the one who talked, who brought me to the new studio. I mean, it's brand spanking there. There wasn't anybody in there doing anything. No recording going on or nothing. Now, that, that is a, 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 big, a big part of it, is this place. Like, meaning you could block your phone calls if you want to. If my mother calls here, no, I'm not here. Uh, that kind of stuff, you know, just anything. I mean, we, we, the goal from the get-go was to build a place where you could come and create and just focus on that. And... Uh, it, I, I haven't seen it too often in, in the world, not like this, uh, because we've taken extra, John rather, took extra steps, and I, I tried to, when I could, to, to, to just make sure everything's okay, make sure everything's okay, you know, no tape machine's going to break, this isn't going to smoke, that's not going to catch on fire, nothing's going to happen, you're okay, everything's just, don't focus, just create. That's the thing I've tried to maintain. I was, you know, an active uh, mixer until 78, 79, but I'd say by 1980 I had, you know, stopped doing it altogether. But, you know, to some extent I think that kind of thing is a young man's game. You know, you don't want to, you know, your appetite for staying up 33 hours in a row diminishes <laughs> after a certain... <laughs> That's when I first met John Fry. Alex introduced me to him. He looked to me like he was 35 years old, and he looked that way for 500 years. I mean, he just looked like he was 35 forever, and I don't even think he was 35 then. He just looked 35, and he looked 35 when he was 50. Who was your best mixer? Me. Okay. No, we've had lots of good mixers at different times and for different things. I mean, Terry Manning was and still is a you know great engineer, did, did a lot of great records. Uh, John Hampton and Joe Hardy and, and you know, Richard Roseborough is a great engineer. You know, it, uh, it, I, I can understand why people get out of it. Some people get out of it as they pass a certain age. Some people seem to be able to soldier on. I mean, there are plenty of people that, 
that uh, that that stick with it. But they're, uh, you know, I got out of it because the business got bigger and somebody kind of had to run the the uh, the business. And and frankly, the other reason that I got out of it is the more tracks we got, the more boring it got. Well, one of the early customers uh, that uh, uh, was was uh, Pepper, the Jingle Company, which then became Pepper Tanner. What they did was really interesting and, and uncommon for this part of the country because they would record large orchestral uh, uh, ensembles. They would record, you know, some of their stuff was, you know, big band style. I got at a very early stage to start engineering some of those sessions. Well, normally that's the kind of experience that you would not have gotten in this part of the country. Doing that and kind of having to do that and step up to the plate and do it because it was, it was scary. You know, I, I mean... I remember doing sessions with 40 players, uh, you know, and we had like 12 microphone inputs and four tracks. That was a kind of experience that I ordinarily wouldn't have gotten. Uh, normally, if you were around Memphis, you would have gotten to record, you know, rhythm instruments, vocals, and a little horn section. So they were one of the customers that helped to make our business successful, but they really helped to educate me and a lot of the other people uh, to to dealing with a lot of things that were that, that were out of the ordinary. Uh, Alex Chilton had been the lead singer in the Box Tops, and he'd come over to our studio with Dan Penn all the time. And his Box Tops deal ran out, and he didn't want to, you know, make any more uh, Box Tops records. And then Alex got involved with a band in a band with a bunch of, of Memphis folks. Uh, one of the guys in there was Chris Bell, and uh, Andy Hummel, you know, played uh, in, in bands with Chris before. And then Jody Stevens was the, uh, the, the drummer. So Alex, Jody, Andy, and Chris were, were big star. And that was the second uh, Ardent Records 70s album. Uh, John Hampton, who's still engineer and producer with us, he started out as what we, we the, the, our entry level character building position here is night guy, okay? Means you answer the telephone at night and try to keep people from stealing everything in the studio and uh, let people in and out the door. And, and, you know, he started out as a night guy. Yeah, when I started, I started uh, working here finally on, on 7777. And my job was, to, I had seen the job before when I had gone in Arden in the past with Alex. Uh, before I started working here, I kind of hung around with Alex and in the studio, uh, and uh, and we just did stupid things. But uh, there was always a guy sitting in front of the first door you come to, and he would wear a little security guard type outfit. And when they told me I was going to be the night guy, I said, oh, no, I'm not going to have to wear that stupid outfit and sit in that chair, am I? And, and they said, no, no, no. You'll be, you can read the manuals and fix gear if you want. And it's like, oh, okay, that'd be fun. I don't start in that thing that I can't end. You know, I even got married to my girlfriend in the morning. I like begging and eggs and I... A lot of times I think uh, to be an engineer uh, that it, and particularly to be a mixer, that it's almost an advantage not to be a, a musician because it allows you to listen, I think, a little bit more in the same way that the ultimate audience listens. There are mixers, you know, 
and their instrument is the drums. They spend three hours, you know, messing with the drums and give 15 minutes to uh, to everything else. Uh, Jim Danson even said that that he thought it was had been an advantage for me because he said that I was non-musical, that it was all just sound to me. Mm -hmm. And therefore, if he would bring in something that was this mixture of music and backward stuff and distortion, that I wouldn't be appalled, that I would just, you know, go at it. I always say there is no loud if there's no silence. I encourage pushing the envelope and trying, you know, doing all this oddball stuff. I'm musically oriented, but not as a player. You know, you don't have to be able to play it. All you have to know, do is know what it's supposed to sound like. To say, you know, here, here's your palette and here's your, um, here's your canvas, and you've got like three primary colors and a couple more. What kind of picture are you going to paint with that? You know, the changes in in uh, in technology that I've seen. In, in my lifetime were enormous. And, you know, when I was a kid, the components were big enough that you could actually see them and handle them. You, you could you'd go down to the store and buy a sack full of these things and put something together and have it work. Uh, you know, now it's, uh, you know, one amplifier then would be uh, uh, this big, and now this console, in it, you know, has in it little integrated circuits that have 20 similar amplifiers on uh, something that you will lose if you're not careful. I mean, you can see the precision engineering in that. That looks like watch, yeah. you know, jewelry. Uh, amazing the links that uh, we go to so that somebody can listen to MP3s through earbuds and computer speakers. <laughs> <laughs> How are you doing? I'm John Hampton, the president of John University home of John Recording Academy and Bait Shop. Not much bait yet because basically first thing we're going to do here is tell you why we're here. We're here because you're probably trying to make a record at home. I've been doing it for a long, long time and I still have pitfalls. So you've got to be running into them left and right. Another pitfall you're going to fall into is you don't know how to record jack. You've never been showed the right way or showed from somebody like me, an award-winning guy who does it all the time. I had been working on this Tora Tora thing for about a million years. I didn't get finished with Tora Tora before I had to go do another A&M record, Gin Blossoms. And we went down there and we treated the thing like just a bunch of guys having fun in the studio. And that thing ended up, that was the first time I just kind of, probably one of the first times I casually made a record. And it sold over four million records. Certainly, Stax wasn't the only successful music enterprise here, but it was by and large in the 70s. It was the mothership. I mean, so much revolved around that, and, and so much of the reason for all of these players and artists and producers and so forth to be in Memphis uh, was because Stax was in Memphis. And it was a big employer. Uh, and it just very abruptly went under. And of course, that was the mid 70s event and that was kind of like uh, the Titanic going down as far as this area was concerned because it's like all the little boats are going to get caught in the in the uh, whirlpool and, and 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 pull down I mean so it was kind of like our record label was gone our biggest customer was gone and a lot of our friends were packing their bags and moving out of town because that's what they had to do to get work around 78 was when I became a Christian and I don't know if it had anything to do with hanging with these guys. It actually had to do with some other events. And, you know, if you, if you had enough tapes, I could give you my testimony, but you probably don't want that. Uh, but I became a Christian in 78, started working with those guys. They didn't have any money. 
I mean, they gave them tiny little budgets to these records, so we'd charge the Christian guys about 25% of what we'd charge the pagan guys, right? Because we, 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 you know, we wanted to, we wanted to encourage that. We thought it was a good thing to do. And we've just been doing that ever since, and have really been, really been blessed in doing it. We've got, you know, to associate with great people. Uh, we've gotten to proclaim a message that I think is the most important one in the world. Yeah, I think there is an argument, sound, and I think it's a very, I think that it's something that um, I hope I have helped turn this boat around. <laughs>